Hello, and good afternoon. I'd first like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to come back to Barcelona and to this wonderful meeting. It gets better every year. And I bring you greetings from San Francisco. My topic is screening in familial and hereditary pancreatic cancer, but I want to start by putting this disease in some context in terms of sporadic risk. In the U.S., and I suspect in many of your countries as well, the incidence of many of the most common cancers is declining in both men and women. And along with that, and not totally attributable to the in decline in incidence, we're seeing a decline in the mortality rates. So it's a very successful story in many malignancies. <clears throat> However, in the disease that I study, we're seeing an increasing incidence. In 2015, in the US, pancreatic cancer caused more deaths than breast cancer. And we think that by 2020, it will be the second most common cause of cancer-related death. And as the decline in age-adjusted mortality in lung cancer continues, we expect it to become the most common cause of cancer-related death unless we can figure out how to change either our treatment paradigms or our paradigms for early detection. So this is kind of a, a tsunami that's ahead of us. A large um, part, we think, of the reason why pancreatic cancer incidence is going up is because in developed countries, our, age, our um, longevity is increasing uh, because we're beating other competing causes of death. And if you look at the incidence per 100,000 by decade, you'll notice here that at approximately age 50, the incidence doubles compared to the decade before. And then it continues to march up until in the very ad advanced years in the 70s, 80s, and over 85, you can get up to um, you know, quite a considerable increase, uh, 78, 92, 100 cases per 100,000. So this is a pretty striking way of thinking about the disease, and as, our, as again, our population is aging very successfully, we're going to see more and more cases. Now, if you look at just the general risk factors for sporadic disease, you'll notice that the, the risk ratios are not very high. Uh, there isn't anything here, even cigarette smoking, that approaches what we see in lung cancer. For instance, in lung cancer, the risk ratio is eightfold uh, for, uh, with a history of smoking. So we don't really have anything that we can hang our hat on to... Um, to really direct our efforts in terms of early detection. Now, one interesting thing about diabetes is that long-standing diabetes is a risk factor for the disease. But short-onset diabetes appears to be caused by the disease. And in the, in the um, diabetes world, pancreatogenic diabetes, type 3 diabetes, is now very well defined. And the notion that pancreatic cancer can cause diabetes through an ill-defined mechanism, probably a perineoplastic mechanism, is really quite real. And this has led the NCI and the NIDDK to mount some studies in new-onset diabetics so that we can start to collect biospecimens and follow these patients over time and understand both the clinical characteristics of pancreas cancer-associated diabetes, as well as whether we can de detect, using a panel of uh, putative early detection biomarkers, the disease very early, or at least earlier, in the course. Now, I think defining hereditary risk in this disease is really important. It's important for two reasons. The first is that you'd like to isolate the family members uh, within a given hereditary syndrome so that they can have more specialized screening. That would be very, very important. The second would be treatment selection. 
And that's becoming increasingly important to me and to all of us who treat these patients because there are certain syndromes in which, as you are probably well aware, that you may want to think about selecting certain uh, specific agents to treat with. Now, I'll start with hereditary pancreatic cancer. This is a, um, this is a recognized syndrome. We don't have a single unifying gene that we can define for all of these different families. So they're really defined descriptively as two or more cases of pancreatic cancer with at least a uh, pair of first degree relatives without a known mutation. And that's how we define the disease. Now the risk in true familial pancreatic cancer is pretty high. Overall, it approaches sevenfold. If you are, have three or more first degree relatives, it's at 17. I don't know why it's less for two first degree or, or one first degree that's uh, approaching four and seven. That's probably just a statistical thing because you can see the confidence intervals are quite wide. And then if you add in a young onset up to ninefold, if you add in smokers, ninefold. So you can see you can begin to approach a risk ratio that would warrant screening. In fact, we believe that the risk has to be about tenfold in order to justify screening uh, for this malignancy. Now these are all of the syndromes that are associated with um, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So familial atypical um, multiple mole and melanoma, the BRCA syndromes, Fanconi anemia, uh, FAP, HNPCC, Pooch Yeager's, hereditary pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, and ataxia telangiectasia. Now the risk ratio varies among these families. You can see that with the uh, FAM syndromes, familial atypical multiple molar melanoma, it's very, very high. So you can arguably, in, in mutation carriers within the, those families, justify screening. It's less certain in the BRCA syndromes. In fact, at our institution, we only recommend screening when there have been cases of uh, pancreatitis in the family. So there still remains a lot of work to be done to try and identify, even within a given family, whether the risk ratio is high enough to warrant screening. But you can see as you go down the list, some of these are extremely high, like Pooch Yeager's, hereditary pancreatitis, uh, but others less clear. When we talk about screening, there are sort of three terms that we use. Um, surveillance is, is, is testing in a high-risk population. Uh, screening is testing in the setting of asymptomatic general population. No, risk, no unusual risk factors, just a general population. And then diagnostic would be uh, some sort of test that you would apply in the setting of a symptomatic situation. Now we know how to image the pancreas. We all know how to image the pancreas. But some of these types of imaging are probably not very useful in terms of detecting uh, early disease, either because of high resolution or because where the disease is located. So pancreatic cancer, at least when we know it histologically, develops within the ductal system. So you re really need a imaging modality that allows you to image the ducts. And so we only really have two, and that is uh, endoscopic ultrasound and MRCP. One could argue ERCP, but that's very invasive or relatively invasive, and you wouldn't want to do that routinely. But MRCP, without any radiation exposure, is very non-invasive and a very good technique, actually. Now I show you this, I can't interpret this, but Mimi Canto, who sent me this slide, says that there's definitely a lesion there. But the reason I'm showing this is just to show you how um, observer-dependent EUS is. It's not the sort of thing where you would have a static image that you could share and everybody could come to some conclusion about what they see there. It, uh, a lot happens over, it's a very dynamic type of study and you have to have very trained in individuals who are doing it. So it's very observer-dependent. Contrast that with MRCP, and I couldn't find an MRCP image that showed the pancreatic duct. This is one where the cancer is actually blocking the duct. Um, but 
contrast that with the detail that you can see with MRCP. And so it largely depends on what technology is available to you, the dedication, for instance, of the uh, gastroenterologist if you're relying on EUS, or the expertise in MR if you're relying on MRCP. We don't have a particular bias over one or the other. It sort of depends on what's available to you in your own community. Oops. We follow the Johns Hopkins approach, and this has largely been the approach that has been used in large studies in the United States, where patients who have um, a high-risk feature undergo either EUS or MRCP. If a lesion is identified, they have follow-up usually in three to six months, and if there are certain evolving changes and those are yet to be defined, then surgery can be recommended. If they don't find anything, then they re generally recommend repeating the study on an annual basis. Now, there have been a lot of studies done to try to identify what we can find in these high-risk families. And this could probably be updated. I haven't updated this slide for a year or so. But the point is that you do find things, but it's not at all clear that the lesions you find represent lesions that you can uh, provide a successful intervention for. And so this is still very much a work in progress. And in fact, we're even hearing of cases in which uh, patients had me metastatic disease evolve within screenings on an annual basis, much like we think of in breast cancer, where the more serious lesions are the ones that come up in between uh, screening. But uh, we do find lesions, and what we're finding really is that and, and you're probably well aware that, that adenocarcinoma of the pancreas can evolve through two different mechanisms. One is at the ductal level through the uh, formation of panins, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasms, or can evolve through sort of like the adenoma, adenocarcinoma sequence, benign tumors that can transform, MCNs, IPMNs. And what we're finding in these families is that we're more likely to find cystic neoplasms, such as MCNs or IPMNs, and we don't quite know or have enough information yet about how to deal with those. Some of them are clear, you know, if they're involving the main branch of the pancreatic, uh, main pancreatic duct, uh, resection is probably indicated. But if it's a side branch lesion, it's not clear what you should do. And pancreatic surgery is not a trivial thing. So it's becoming a, a real conundrum for gastroenterologists in terms of who to recommend for surgical intervention. Now, the story in terms of treatment selection is getting a lot more interesting. Many of you are aware that recently pembrolizumab in the United States was approved, given accelerated approval, uh, for all MSI high tumors, regardless of the site of origin. And I've showed you a slide early on where um, HNPCC was a disease and uh, was a syndrome in which pancreatic cancer could occur in excess. And the other uh, area that is very interesting is mutations that involve, uh, germline mutations that involve DNA damage repair pathways. Now in terms of uh, the MSI high tumors, there has been a study that has been uh, presented by Young Lee from ASCO at uh, ASCO uh, last year in which she studied a cohort of non-colorectal cancers that were MSI high. And you can see that there's, it's, it all covers the map. Uh, you don't see breast cancer there or lung cancer, but you see just about everything else. And you'll notice that there were very few pancreatic cancers, that's the purple, very few pancreatic cancers studied, but responses were seen in um, you know, two out of uh, three in this uh, waterfall plot. And so I'm just going to give you a case, and this is just a case from our own clinic. Um, which a 47-year-old man who had just recently, his wife had just recently given birth to twins, walked into our clinic. He had a prior history of colorectal cancer, and he presented with locally advanced adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. He did respond well to Fulferinox, but he progressed after about a year. We were able to get him on Pembro on a clinical trial, and he responded. And his response continues today. And he's in a complete remission. This is transformative for this particular patient. 
And it's prompted us, at UCSF at least, to mandate that all patients have uh, MMR testing um, on their tumors so that we can find those rare individuals who may benefit from uh, treatment with a checkpoint inhibitor. We realize that it's a, it's a small fraction, probably 1% of all of our patients, but the, the effect is so transformative that it's really worth looking for them. So the other thing I mentioned was the patients who have uh, germline mutations in DNA damage repair pathways. Just like in um, ovarian cancer or in breast cancer, pancreatic cancer patients seem to benefit from, from uh, platinum-containing regimens, and particularly cisplatin. And I, Lean O'Reilly and, and colleagues around the world really are, are doing us a great favor right now by conducting a very important trial in BRCA-positive or PALB2-positive patients in which they're being randomized to gemcitabine and cisplatin or gemcitabine, cisplatin, and, and uh, valiparib. And I think that, you know, the checkpoint it, uh, or the PARP inhibitors are very important, but the other thing that's really good about this trial is it's going to give us benchmarking data about the role of gemcitabine and cisplatin, the combination without the targeted agent, as sort of a backbone in this patient population. This trial is still um, enrolling patients, but Eileen has allowed me to show you a couple of cases. Uh, this is a, a patient who was treated with the triple combination, including the, um, the uh, PARP inhibitor. And you can see the uh, tremendous response that this patient had. But this is not a blinded trial. And Eileen also showed me this case, which is, again, a dramatic response with just the chemotherapy doublet. And it's really led us in our NCCN guidelines to reinforce the importance of considering gemcitabine cisplatin as a treatment regimen in patients with um, DNA repair damaging mutations. Um, it's a much easier regimen to take than something like fulferinox, for instance. So the take home lessons of this small discussion is first, really do a good family history. Um, it's amazing what you can learn, and be very um, preemptive, I think, of patients who, who have a family history of cancer or who are um, young. Um, you remember families are smaller now, and so sometimes even one or two uh, uh, cases of any kind of cancer in a family might lead you down a path towards a, a potential syndrome. Obviously, once you find uh, either an affected family with familial pancreatic cancer or a syndrome that has pancreatic cancer in excess, at least tenfold or higher, uh, you would recommend screening for family members with either EUS or MRCP, depending on the technology available to you. For MSI high tumors, consider early use of a checkpoint inhibitor. And for patients with DNA uh, damage repair mutations, please consider gemcitabine and cisplatin. And I would argue even in the adjuvant setting. We will never have an adjuvant trial done in this rare patient population. But given their exquisite response, I think it's a reasonable uh, conclusion to make. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.